Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all. Thank you for, I got one good morning back. That was good. Uh, good to, uh, everybody, I hope everybody's had their coffee. And uh, y'all, I was walking in the church building and my stomach growled. And I thought, I'm going to preach fast today. And that never happens. Uh, it just never happens in the middle of it. Well, guys, thank y'all for being here. Uh, worshiping with us today, those of you who are here in the room, those of you who are joining us at home and then uh, later on uh, on YouTube as well when we upload that. Uh, let me uh, give you a couple of updates on some uh, church life sort of stuff before I pray for us and, uh, and the choir sings. Uh, a few folks have asked about our uh, plans for our new uh, pictorial directory. If you'll remember, before uh, the world turned upside down, uh, we would have been uh, in the middle of and, and really moving forward quite a bit uh, as far as getting a new updated directory. Uh, well, because of all the stuff going on with COVID and the different things, uh, just that's all going to be shifted uh, to late spring of, of 2021. So it's still, we're still talking to the company. We still got some dates set in the future. We're just going to assume that those things are going to work out, but don't worry. It hadn't been forgotten, but uh, we're just, we're not able uh, to do it right now, obviously, since so many of our folks are just, are staying home and, and not getting uh, out and about. So that's one. Number two, uh, be sure to mark on your calendars. We are taking our next step as far as church life goes of trying to get things back to whatever normal is or was. Uh, but starting in September, we're going to start back with our Wednesday night uh, services. And so uh, that is going to start on September the 2nd, Wednesday, September the 2nd. That's the first Wednesday of that month. And so we'll, be, uh, do, we'll still be in here. Uh, we'll be doing a prayer meeting. Uh, the youth will be meeting. The kids will be doing uh, be doing a wana. Uh, we've been doing VBS on Sunday night, kind of trying to see what we could do as far as how all that stuff coordinates with the kids and the workers and the masks and all that sort of thing. And it's going well, so it's time to take that next step. So starting September the second, uh, service will be at six o'clock. Uh, those three things will start at six, and then I'll wrap up a prayer meeting around six forty-five or so, and then the choir. You guys will start. Um, start choir practice as soon as as soon as Bill can uh, get you guys organized uh, and uh, and get to uh, to rehearsing for that. So that's going to be the the first Wednesday night in September. So six o'clock is when everything will happen, and then uh, we'll go from there. And also that next Sunday, September the sixth, we're going to add one more element to our Sunday morning worship. Uh, and that is we will have a children's church during Sunday morning worship. Now, it, won't be, it will not be the entire time. What's going to happen is the kids will stay in here uh, with us for the first part of the service for uh, congregational singing and that sort of thing. And then at sermon time, so they don't have to listen to me, uh, they can go, they're going to they're head out and go have children's church for that second half. Uh, of service. And so Joe Don's going to be uh, directing them. They'll be following him out for that. And so that starts uh, that first Sunday in September. So we're making just a few little adjustments uh, along the way to try to, to take those next steps to get church life back to as normal or as we can uh, in craziness, understanding the whole time that one little thing could just throw the whole thing off. We get, we have, that's the world we live in right now, but that's the plan. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's our next step. Well, guys, let me pray for us, and then uh, the choir is going to sing. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our church. We thank you for uh, just the, the calling to serve you here together. Lord, I pray during this hour you would fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we would worship you as we sing, as we pray, as I preach, as we consider and respond to your word. Lord, I thank you for everyone here in this room. I thank you for everyone who's watching, everyone who will watch throughout the week. And just pray you would use this time to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.
good morning, church family and guests. I appreciate that. Thank you. This morning, I, I wanted to share with you just a psalm uh, that is so beautiful to me that the header on uh, the section before the psalm, it's Psalm 24, says the King of glory, and it speaks to God as the King of glory and how we should respond to him. So I'm just going to read uh, verses 1 through 5 of, out of chapter 24. It says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He whose, he whose hands are clean and has a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. Good morning, church family. It's good to see you all this morning. All right, we're going to sing, Blessed is the Name. If you would please stand today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. As we come to pray, let's remember to pray for... Uh, administrators, uh, teachers, staff, parents, and students. Uh, as you know, a new school year is upon us. Some started this past week, some are going to start tomorrow, and some are starting a little bit later. But let's remember and commit together to pray for them, okay, as a church. Let's pray together at this time. Father God, we do indeed bless your name. Uh, Father, for you are worthy of our worship. You are holy. Father, there is no one like you. And it's good to remind ourselves of that as we worship together as a church family this morning. Father, I thank you for the Psalms that over and over again tells us a phrase. And that phrase is, the Lord reigns. 
And Father, I pray that as we worship and as we live our lives, that we would keep that in mind in everything that we face. Um, Lord, just to know that you reign over all, that you are sovereign, and that we can trust you and, and just hold on to you, Father, with everything we have by faith. Father, I pray that you would be with uh, administrators and teachers and staff and parents and students as they face this new school year. We know it will look different, but Lord, you are still the same. You're the unchanging God. And our hope is in you. So we pray that you'd help us as a church to encourage them, to stand alongside them, and to help them throughout this school year. Father, I pray for this service that you'd continue to help us as we worship you. I pray for Brother John. Lord, empower him by your Holy Spirit as he preaches your word. Father, I also understand that all of us in here, whether we're here in person or watching, that we're all going to respond in some way to your word. And I pray with all my heart today. The Lord, we would all respond in faith and obedience. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would please stand one more time. For he touched me by the wonderful Bill Gaither. Shackled by a hand. Thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate you filling in for Bill today. I'm not used to having uh, somebody lead music with that much hair. It's just, um, I was confused. Spiritually, I was, I was just confused. And uh, no, I, I really appreciate him stepping up and doing that. Bill is somewhere on top of a mountain in East Tennessee, uh, somewhere. I don't know if he's coming back or not. They, they were heading out to the wilderness, and he was like, I may see you again. I might not. Uh, no, they're having a, a much needed uh, time together, he and Brenda, and uh, so I appreciate Andrew stepping up and, uh, and leading. And uh, we're kind of on a different crew today, so I, do, I don't want to embarrass him, but I probably am going to. Roy has stepped up to, to uh, run the sound and all that stuff today. Jeff and Susan are, are on vacation as well, and so just appreciate those guys uh, stepping in and, and filling those roles. And uh, it's just we're very blessed as a church. Uh, to have real folks with servants' hearts and uh, willing to step in and, and serve as they can. So, guys, thank you so much for that. You know, uh, sermons should always have a goal. 
You know, you should never step in if you're even if you're a Sunday school teacher or, or anything else. You'd always should always have a goal as for what you're trying to uh, accomplish when you're teaching the Word of God or preaching the Word of God. And most of the time, the text. Uh, will dictate that. Sometimes it's encouragement. Sometimes it's uh, you know confrontational. Sometimes it's just to to bring you to a point of worship or consideration or whatever it might be. Um, the goal today, my goal today is a very simple one, and that is is to make everybody as uncomfortable as possible. And, and, and I say that because in the verses that, that Jesus, in these verses we're going to look at, Jesus is going to say some pretty serious stuff, honestly some scary stuff for everybody who's a member of a church, everybody who's walked an aisle, everybody who's been in a baptistry, everybody who's on a, on a church roll or attends Sunday school or, or whatever it might be, because Jesus is going to confront us and say, and ask and, and cause us to step back and think, do I actually know him? See, I claim to, but do I actually? And that can be an uncomfortable thing for church folks as we are. So take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. We're in this concluding section of the Sermon on the Mount. The conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount is really verses 13 through the end of the chapter. And, and in these verses, Jesus is beginning to, to wrap everything up. And in 13 and 14, he's told us about the narrow gate, about the narrow way. And, and we see how there's only one way to be saved, and that's through him. And so because of that truth in verses 15 through 20, he warns us that there are false teachers out there. If there's only one way, only one true way to know God, we better make sure we know that true way and be aware that there are people out there who teach some other way that is not actually the way. It's, it's false and it'll eventually lead to eternal destruction. And so it just makes sense that now Jesus, who's speaking to disciples, remember this all started way back in chapter 5 with him speaking to his disciples. He's talking to saved people here, his followers. And so it makes sense at this point that right before he gives that final illustration of, of, the, of the foundation of the rock and the sand and all those things that we're so familiar with, before he does that, he pauses and he says, all right, guys, do you actually know me? Are you genuine, genuinely saved? Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The question that I want to ask in the sermon today is, how do we know that we're saved? How do we know that we're saved? See, in these, these three verses, Jesus gives us two very distinct people. He, he described, before we even get into it, and I give you the, the, the two sentences and all of that, he, he describes two people. He, he mentions, he who does the will of my Father, and then he mentions, you who practice lawlessness. And those are the two people that he's talking to. He, he's going to come in and, and point out that there are people who consistently do the Word of God and there are people who consistently rebel against the Word of God. So I want to give you two sentences today as we walk through these verses. And the first one is this. If we are saved, then we will live with consistent godliness. If we are saved, then we will live with consistent godliness. Now hear me on this. There are times when you and I, as believers, don't act godly. There are times when we sin. There are times when we fall short of the glory of God. There are times because we're not perfected yet, because Christ has not returned yet, because we're still growing in our faith. There are times when we say things we shouldn't say, when we think things we shouldn't think, when, when we know we're in rebellion and we do it. But those things are, to, are not to define us. They are to be the exception rather than the rule. And when we do those things, when we stray, when we rebel against God, we come under conviction, we repent of that sin, and then we continue on on our, on our journey of growing in our faith. Notice what Jesus says in verse 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. 
So he makes a, a blanket statement that is quite frightening. And that is there are people who will claim to be believers. There are people who will claim to be followers of Christ who absolutely do not know him and who are as lost as the person who says there is no God, as the person who, who laughs and mocks Christianity. Not everyone who, who, call, who, who says, Lord, Lord, not everyone who claims to follow Christ, he says, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about eternity. He's talking about that final thing, that, that, that completed salvation. That, that, that third part, the I have been saved, the I am being saved, the I will be saved. He's, he's talking about how when everything comes to culmination, he says, not everyone who has said they followed me will enter that kingdom, but he tells us who will. Notice what he says. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. See that word does? It's an important word. And in the original, it's very clear. He's talking about those who consistently and constantly do the will of God. It's what defines them as a person. It's who they are. It's, a, it's someone who has truly repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's impacted the way they think, the way they talk, the way they act. They're, they're, they're seeking to worship God in every aspect of their life. Yes, they sin occasionally because they're not perfect yet. Yes, they mess up occasionally. But when that happens, there's conviction of sin and there's repentance. And then there's moving forward in their walk with him. He, he describes it, says, he who consistently, who constantly does the will of my father who is in heaven. So that then asks the question, well, what's God's will? If it's saved people, if it's genuinely saved people that do God's will, what is God's will? Well, I'm going to kind of step sideways out of the text for a minute and then come back in. Because I, I want us to understand that if you truly repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ, you've responded to God's will. Because it's God's will for people to be saved. It's God's will for people to come to faith in Him. Let me, let me give you some verses. The concluding verses of this, of this gospel, the thing that Matthew is leading up to, Matthew 28, 18 and 20, says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The final command of Matthew's gospel. And, God's will is simply his commands for us is go and make disciples. Seeing lost people saved and saved people grow. That's all discipleship is. It's very simple. It's a long process, but it's not complicated. Jesus would say in John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40 of himself, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on that last day. It's God's will for people to come to faith in him. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. King James says, to usward. It's a great little phrase there. But is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So it's God's will for people to repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ. And once that happens, once, once people are truly saved, then Jesus says you can tell they're truly saved if they continually do the will of God. So that question is, if it's the will of God for people to be saved, what, what is God's will once those people are saved? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have some more verses. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 50. Jesus says this. But whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother, sister, and mother. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God. And that should just make all of us stand up. Say, oh, the Bible's going to literally tell us this is the will of God. Your sanctification, that is, you abstain from sexual immorality. And then he goes on to a long list of things there in 1 Thessalonians. It is God's will for you to grow in sanctification. It's God's will for you to live a life free from the power of sin, to, be, to grow in your faith. Romans 12, 1 through 2. 
Paul writes, therefore, I, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. It is God's will for you and I to, to present our bodies as living and holy sacrifices to honor him with all aspects of our lives. John would say this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God, check it out. The one who does the will of God lives forever. Those words were written by John, who was sitting at the feet of Jesus when he was preaching Matthew chapter 7. He heard for years Jesus say, the one who truly follows me is the one who does the will of God. And John, as an old man writing in 1 John, says that the one who does the will of God lives forever. It's the consistent message throughout the New Testament that, that a person who is genuinely saved seeks to continually live out the will of God in their life. Now, but remember the warning Jesus said. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That means there are people, there are people who claim to be saved. There are people who claim to be followers of Christ. There are people, I'm sure, on our church role and on every church role who, who, who say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And they are absolutely lost and they don't seek to fill God's will. They don't seek to do God's will because spiritually they've never been made new. They've never been born again. They look right. They say the right stuff. They know how to come to church and smile even behind the mask. Y'all look at people's eyes now to try to figure out if they're smiling or not. Sometimes I smile at people and realize they have no idea what I'm doing. I feel like it, it, it's the equivalent of, you know, when you, you think somebody's waving at you and you wave back and realize they're waving at somebody else and you feel like you just want to crawl in a hole and die. I feel, you know, you feel like that when you smile at somebody behind your mask and they have no idea what's going on with your face. It, it's the strangest thing, you know. And, and so there are people out there that they look right. They say the right stuff, they come to church and they smile, they shake hands, they, they sing the songs, they are in Sunday school every week, they were baptized at some point, they walked an aisle at some point and they shook a preacher's hand and yet, when it actually comes down to are they spiritually alive or spiritually dead, they're dead. They don't know Jesus. I've told y'all I had a bit of a unique adolescence. I, I've given my testimony a couple times and. Uh, I didn't play. I'm not a good athlete. I didn't play a lot of sports growing up. But when I was about 11 years old, I, I discovered I discovered nine ball. I was a pool player as a, as a teenager. And after a few years, I got to where, and other people could do this as well, you could watch somebody play. You could, you could watch them take just one or two shots, and you knew immediately, is this person a good player or are they not? It, you guys who are golfers or athletes, you recognize this. If you go to the golf course and, and you're out on the driving range and there's somebody near you and they're really good, you see it immediately. You know what it's supposed to look like. And so I would play in tournaments and things and, and somebody new would come in and, and try to, you know, get their handicap set up and all of this. And you had to kind of, kind of try to figure out, well, how good was this person? How good were they not? And I got to where I was pretty good at it. I would do it for the play. So it asked me, will you play this person for 10, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to kind of figure out, you know, where they should be within, within all of this. Except there was one guy. There was one guy and I never knew his name. He only came in every two or three months that he would come and play in the tournaments. I played in a Thursday night tournament, and this fellow would come in, and by all appearances, he should have been one of the best players in that tournament. When he walked around the table, he walked around like he was really good. And I don't mean like he strutted. There's a, you can just tell there's a confidence in it. The way that he, he stood, his stance, he looked like a great player. The way he stroked his cue, he looked like a great player. Y'all, he was terrible. He was awful. I couldn't, I, it, was, it was baffling every time I saw it. I would watch it and think, this should not be happening. Everything looks right, but something's terribly wrong. I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if he needed glasses and just refused to get them or, or what it was, but everything looked right. But when it actually came down to playing the game, he was awful. You, you know folks like that. 
You know, folks that, that put on a, the, the right thing, they look the right way, they say the right stuff, and yet something's not right about them. And there are many people in our churches that know how to go through the motions, and yet they don't actually know Jesus. And when it comes to standing before God at the judgment seat, he's going to look at them and say, I never knew you. You and I think they're absolutely saved. They do all the same stuff we do. Listen, the other disciples thought Judas was one of them. He did all the same stuff. But you have to actually know him. And when you know him, you're going to seek to consistently do his will. So how do we know that we're saved? Well, if we're saved, we'll live a life with consistent godliness. Here's the second sentence. If we're not saved, then we'll live with consistent godlessness. Consistent godlessness. Look at verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He talks about that day. He says, many will say to me on that day. What's he talking about? He's talking about the day of the Lord. He, he has a Jewish audience here. Matthew's gospel is written to a Jewish audience and the Sermon on the Mount is given to a Jewish audience. And the Old Testament, when it talks about the end of time, compresses all the stuff. You know, the New Testament gives us the details of the end of time. The Old Testament often compresses it down to one thing and calls it the day of the Lord. And so Jesus is talking about the judgment. He's talking about when all everything comes to fruition, when everything is complete and, and we're standing before the Lord and he, you know, the, the sheep and the goats are being separated. When that happens on that day, on the judgment day, these folks are going to say, wait a minute. We did, we did stuff. We prophesied and we cast out demons. We performed miracles. We did all kinds of stuff. They looked like they were truly followers of him. And they did it in his name. You'll notice that they say, in your name cast out demons, in your name perform miracles. It literally says, Lord, did, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy. In your name cast out demons, in your name perform miracles. Even in that first sentence, in my English translation, it says, did we not prophesy in your name. But the in your name is in the emphatic point in all three of those phrases. And they're saying, wait a minute, we did this stuff for you. We did this stuff for Jesus. We, we claimed to know you and we served you and we did all of this. And he says, no, you're not mine. I don't know you. And you think, well, that's a scary thought. Well, here's the thing, though. He makes clear that these folks never actually knew him in the first place. And they should be able to tell. Look at verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. And then he describes them, you who practice lawlessness. See that word for practice? It's just like the word do in verse 21. It means consistently, constantly. These are folks who are in constant rebellion against God. These are folks who are putting on a show. These are folks who didn't actually know him. In fact, it's probably the folks in verse 15, the false prophets, who are trying to sneak their way in, try to convince the Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did the stuff. Yeah, we did. No, and it's not true. So people can either try to fool others, and sometimes people are actually fooled themselves. Some people think they're saved when they're not. Listen, you might be here this morning, and you got shortchanged somewhere along the way. That when somebody shared the gospel with you, they, they didn't do it right. And they told you, you got manipulated in, in, a, in a service or something, and, and you, your buddy got up and walked the aisle, and you just went with them. And all you did was shake a preacher's hand or fill out a card and get in the water and get baptized. And nobody ever told you about repentance and faith and lordship. And you're counting on and depending on something, some motion and some actions you went through, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. But there was never any genuine surrender to Christ. You just did the stuff that the people at the time told you to do. And yet the gospel says that if you're truly, if you truly follow him, Matthew's gospel says you will consistently do the word of God. Those who don't know him consistently practice lawlessness. They're in rebellion. Jesus says, I never knew you. Titus chapter 1 verse 16 says, They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. 
And he looks at him and he says, depart from me. And that final command, they'll obey that one because they don't have a choice. Because he is the judge. He's also the executioner. And they'll go into eternal torment, into eternal death. So just as true salvation brings about a life defined by obedience, false salvation is shown through a life defined by disobedience. It's one or the other. You're either saved or you're not. Where do you stand today? It's Sunday morning, guys, and we've all come together, put on our masks, gotten out in a crazy time to come and to worship. But do you know that wearing a mask on Sunday and showing up in the midst of COVID-19 season, all that, it doesn't save anybody. It's commendable. I'm glad you're here. It's a whole lot better than preaching that iPad by myself like we did for a few months. But those things are just things we do in order to come together and worship. But you can't actually worship him in a genuine way unless you've truly repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ. See, if we're saved, we're going to live with consistent godliness. And if we're not saved, we'll live with consistent godlessness. So let me ask you a question. Are you genuinely saved? Are you actually saved? Or are you just going through the motions? Are you just faking it and you know you're faking it? Let me, let me talk to those people first. Maybe some, uh, somebody like that's watching. Maybe there's somebody in the room. You know deep down in your heart that you don't know the Lord. But it's been so long. You've been in church for so long. Everybody around you just assumes you know him. Your spouse might even assume you know him. You're a good husband, you're a good wife, you're a good dad, you're a good granddad, you're a good mother, grandmother. All those things are true, but you, you know. You know you don't know him. Let me read something to you. Acts chapter 20, verses 20 and 21. Apostle Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders. And he says, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you truly, genuinely repented of your sins? Have you asked God to forgive you of your sins? Have you confessed your sins to him and walked away from him? Have you repented? And have you placed your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord? That means he's in charge. We sing a song, I surrender all. To become a believer means that we give everything to the Lordship of Christ. Our heart, our mind, our will, our emotions, everything. And if you were shortchanged and just told, hey, come shake this preacher's hand. Hey, just fill out this card. Hey, just go through the baptistry. And, and nobody ever explained to you what it meant to surrender your life to Jesus. I'm sorry that happened. And it wasn't right. But I want you to hear me today that Christ is Lord. And one day every knee, the New Testament is very clear, one day everybody, every knee will bow, even those that eventually will be cast into hell because that's who he is. He is Lord of all. He is the creator. It's through him this world was even created. But what I'm asking today is if you have claimed and, and claimed to follow Jesus and yet in these moments and maybe even in the years preceding this have realized you don't know him, the gospel has not changed. And that is if you will simply call on the name of the Lord. You'll be saved. Let me read to you from Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. Paul would write that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as, notice what it says, Lord. He's in charge, he's boss. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart a person believes resulting in righteousness and with a mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. What's this mean? It means in order to be saved, you have to go to God and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And confess them to him. And say, Lord, I, I, I've done this and I've done that. And just, just bring all that to bear. He knows you've done it. It's not a secret. Nobody, maybe the rest of us may be ignorant of it, but he knows. He knows everything. Confess it to him. Say, Lord, I sinned against you here and I sinned against you here. And Lord, forgive me of that. You confess your sins to him. 
And then, then, then you tell him, say, Lord, I, I believe. I believe that Jesus came and died for me and was buried and rose again. And I, I place my faith and my trust in him as Lord. He is now in charge of my life completely. And you just call on God's name and cry out to him for salvation. Have you done that? Do you know him? I'm not asking, are you a member of this church? I'm not asking, are you a member of Sunday school class? not asking, do you teach Sunday school, or are you a deacon, or do you serve on a committee? Are you working VBS, or volunteering in different places? That's not what I'm asking. All those things are great, but they come after. They're secondary. Is Jesus your Lord? Genuinely your Lord? Do you seek to do the will of God consistently in your life? And when you don't, when you and I don't do the will of God, is there conviction about that? Is there conviction of sin and you repent of that and say, Lord, forgive me, I, I messed up. I, I went off on that person in Walmart. Lord, I cut that person off in traffic and, and did this. Lord, I, I have not been a, a godly spouse. Lord, I've not been a godly parent. I've been a horrible employee, whatever it might be. And you're under conviction about that because you're saved and yet you still struggle with sin. Just confess that to the Lord. But do you genuinely know him? Jesus said that there are those who are going to say, Lord, I did this and I did that and I did that. And he's going to look at him and say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Does he know you? Have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ as Lord? So here's what we're going to do. Obviously, with all the different ways we're doing things, we're not doing come forward invitations right now. But at the end of service today, after I pray for us, if the Lord's gotten a hold of you, you come and you talk to me. I'm not going anywhere. I'm usually one of the last ones out of the building. You come, you talk to me, you talk to Joe Don, you talk to Adam. You grab a deacon if you don't want to talk to one of us. You say, I need to be saved. I realize Christ is not my Lord. I realize I've just been faking it. You might not have realized until these verses got a hold of you. Maybe you've known for years. Preachers have said for years, and it's a true statement, they'll say things like, what if, if you died today, do you know that God would let you into heaven? Guys, that statement has never been more true. COVID's real. It about killed a friend of mine. You and I get that stuff, we better make sure we're right with the Lord. We're, we're in much more danger now of having to answer that question than we were six months ago. Do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? Maybe you're watching at home and the Lord's gotten a hold of you. Here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to send an email. Uh, you can send it to me, John, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. My, my wife normally puts it in, in the comments. So John, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. You can send that email. Or just send a Facebook message to the church. The only people that will see it are the staff, so it will stay within that, within that circle. And, uh, and we'll respond to that, and we'll talk about what it means uh, to truly know Christ as Lord and Savior. And then I would say this for every believer, that you genuinely know, genuinely know the Lord. You pray for those around you who claim to know Christ and pray for them to have clarity Pray for them to know for sure that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. Well, guys, thank you for being here today. I'm going to pray for us. If you guys will stand and then turn your chairs around. Now you turn your chairs so Amy will know which ones to wipe down. For, for those of you watching at home, that noise has to be really bizarre. Uh, I just, I've only been home one week watching this, and I, I don't remember uh, if that happened or not. But I appreciate you guys doing that to, to help us out. I'm not going anywhere. Adam's not going anywhere. Joe Don's not going anywhere. If you guys need to talk about what it means, we'll sit down and we'll go through these things. But guys, don't go through another moment without knowing whether or not you truly know Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for these verses. They are difficult verses. 
uh, to deal with. And Lord, I pray that if there's one here who doesn't know you, that they would, would call on your name and be saved. If there's one watching who doesn't know you, that they'd call on your name and be saved. And I pray for those who do know you, Lord, that we would continually seek to do your will. We would repent and confess when we, when we do those things contrary to it. Lord, I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for everyone involved in the service today. And just ask you to bless us as we leave here. Use us this week for your glory, for your name's sake alone. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.